I'm going to talk about the phallus, and especially about how the phallus is figured in psychoanalysis. The main question that we first come upon when we think about the phallus in psychoanalysis is, why insist on the phallus at all? It's a pretty good question. And I think a lot of people say to themselves, wow, I could stomach psychoanalysis a lot better if I didn't have to deal with this concept of phallus that they're constantly mentioning all the time. One idea, and this is an idea that comes from Alenka Zupancic, is that psychoanalysis shows how the phallus works. So it's just showing us what's really going on in the social order. And if we didn't talk about the phallus, we would miss something crucial about what happens. So as Alenka puts it, that we have to expose the phallus rather than to let it operate as a mystery. And that those doctrines that don't talk about the phallus and turn it into a different name end up allowing it to function as a mystery as it has throughout history. So psychoanalysis really, as Alenka sees it, is the first radical attempt to undermine the power of the phallus. So instead of accusing Freud of phallocentrism, we should say, here's one of the first guys, there are women, of course, before him, here's one of the first guys who exposed the lie of phallocentrism rather than investing himself in it. So he did not allow the function of the phallus to remain a mystery. Instead, he brought it to the surface. And one thing that can help us make sense of the idea of the phallus is to think of this chain of equivalences of phallus, name of the father, and master signifier. All those terms basically mean the same thing, especially in the thought of Jacques Lacan. And that's a thought that I'm going to develop here although maybe departing from it in slight ways. This is Jacques Lacan's fifth seminar, Formations of the Unconscious, which was done in the late 1950s. And in this seminar, he says, the signifier of the signified in general is the phallus, which means the phallus signifies everything that's signified. The phallic signifier signifies signification as such, which means it doesn't have its own precise signified, unlike every other signifier. So this is very important that the phallic signifier is not just a garden variety signifier. It's one that stands out. It's the master signifier that stands out because it signifies all signification. And signification as such is castration. So the phallus is the signifier of castration. Very important idea that the phallus signifies signification as such, which means it signifies castration. And you might say, in this sense, that the phallus is a signifier of an absence enjoyment, an enjoyment that is, is had only through absence or that's not there. And early on in his thought, Lacan makes this point that the phallus indicates the enjoyment that we've given up as a subject to have a symbolic identity. Of course, we never really had this enjoyment. So the phallus indicates what's theoretically sacrificed by the subject and what the subject always feels like it's lost. That's what it signifies. As a result, the phallic signifier enjoys in one stead. That means the phallic signifier takes the enjoyment of the subject. So when the subject dons the signifier, or puts on signifiers that indicate the phallic position. It's always those signifiers that enjoy, not the subject itself. What happens is there's a senselessness to the phallic signifier because it has no precise signified. It has no signified at all, except all of the signifiers. Its enjoyment has to be senseless. And this is really nicely illustrated, I think, in a little clip of The Great Dictator by Charlie Chaplin, when he's playing the figure of Herr Hinkel, who is an uh, allusion to, to of, of course, Hitler. Hey, the 
Was mit dem Ding? Meine Täter wieder strafen, die strafen, die strafen! Adnoid Hinkler has just said yesterday Tumania was down, but today she has risen. What stands out about this speech is that the words don't make any sense. Occasionally, he throws in a real German word like sauerkraut or strafen, but most of the time, he just is employing words that don't mean anything because it's the actual act of speaking of the master where the enjoyment is found, and the enjoyment is in his, and it's nicely shown that the phallic enjoyment actually is taken up by the crowd less than by him. There's another great scene in David Lynch's Blue Velvet where we can see the nonsense of the phallic signifier and the character who takes up the figure of the phallus and how all he can do is spout basic nonsense. He can basically say just the same thing. You want to go with Raymond? Come on. I'll see you Tuesday, Frank. Right then. Now it's dark. Let's fuck! I'll fuck anything that moves! <laughs> So throughout the film, Frank Booth repeats the word fuck so often that it ceases to actually signify anything, and it's this nonsensical repetition of fuck, I'll fuck anything that moves, let's fuck. All of this shows that the word has lost any sense, and it loses sense because it's attached that all the phallus can do is repeat this enjoyment that it's actually lost. And when Frank Booth, earlier in the film, we see that he's actually unable to really have sex. So the lack is really evident in a figure like him. He's constantly speaking fuck, but unable to actually do it. And that's one of Lynch's most brilliant diagnoses of the phallic signifier and the figure of phallic power. So the point here is that phallic authority strips away the subject's enjoyment. You can put on the garments of phallic authority, but when you do, you cede your enjoyment to those garments. Because Phallic power requires castration, that if you adopt the position of the phallus, you immediately accede to the castration that it implies. You can see here, this is Richard the Lionhearted, it's the figure of the crown that embodies the phallic power, not him. And then in the common figure of the tie today, the tie embodies phallic power, not the person wearing it. What's crucial about the phallus is that one cannot openly brandish it. You cannot openly take it up. It always has to be hidden. So phallic power, you might say, is the illusion of power lying beneath. It's the illusion of a signified power. So the phallus says to us, I'm not the power. The power is beneath. But as we know, as we've seen, there's nothing beneath. The phallus signifies castration, so there's an absence beneath. This is why Jacques Lacan, in his famous essay, The Signification of the Phallus, says that the phallus can play its role only when veiled, because it doesn't really have the power that it pretends to have, so it has to be veiled. But not only does it have to be veiled, just to add to what Lacan says here, even its veil has to be veiled. It cannot openly be veiled. One effect of the veiling of the phallus, the necessary veiling of the phallus, is the restriction on male nudity relative to female nudity in films. So female nudity everywhere, male nudity very, it's very few and far between we see scenes of male nudity. And in fact, this is a, this is a, uh, a, a card, a title card from the film Baywatch, and so the language is bad. Brief graphic nudity, there's no female nudity, it's just a slight view of a penis, and that gets it this graphic designation. So not only is it rated R, but it's called graphic nudity just because it's a penis. 
And here's a shot of a very, very brief glimpse of uh, Ben Affleck in the film Gone Girl. And this is just showing how seldom we see this. And this is just one little brief glimpse and then it's gone. The other way that we see the phallus veiled is through all the accoutrements that cover up the man. And I think this is most nicely shown in a film called Cool Hand Luke, where we see one of the guards who almost never speaks wear these dark sunglasses and a cowboy hat in order to cover his power. And so you think there's power lying beneath the sunglasses and the cowboy hat, but actually, this is the point of the phallus, the power is in the sunglasses and cowboy hat, not in what lies beneath. Take the grass here, boss! Get up here, boss! Ah! Hey, boss. We got your walking stick. Man, you sure can shoot. Incredibly intimidating. I wouldn't want him hanging out with a gun near me, even though Paul Newman seems not too bothered by him. Uh, but it's the glasses, right, that are the source of the phallic power. The, the glasses are the phallus, and they are the veiling, and they are the phallus. So the veiling is the way in which the phallus functions. But if the veiling becomes obvious, then castration becomes obvious. So the phallus can perform its function only when veiled, but we also cannot become aware of the veiling. Otherwise, castration becomes obvious. So the overt veil, this is why men don't wear veils, because the overt veil makes the castration evident. So men do not wear, they wear dark sunglasses instead of a veil. And this was nicely evinced during the epidemic by Donald Trump, who said, somehow I don't see it for myself, I just don't. And he was speaking, of course, about wearing a mask. Now, on occasion, he did wear a mask, but he, he tried never to be photographed wearing a mask, precisely for this reason, I think, that he, if we saw the actual veil on his face, then we would recognize that the veil is evident and he is castrated. So when the veil becomes apparent, the phallus the phallic function stops working. And I think this is very nicely shown in the case of Trump, why he resists wearing the mask altogether, because he's so invested in himself as a phallic figure who's not subjected to castration, but the veil indicates castration. The obviousness of the veil makes it clear that the subject is lacking, makes it clear that the subject is castrated. So investment in a symbolic role is always investment in the phallus. And masculinity is the faith in both the phallic signifier and in the symbolic status that it accords to someone in a symbolic position. So masculinity is utter faith in the symbolic, but it's really faith in what lies beneath. So to believe in the phallus is to believe in the power of what lies beneath, to believe that the real thing is beneath, not on the surface. And you believe that the signifier indicates this power lying beneath. To opt for masculinity is always to cede one's subjectivity to one's symbolic identity. I think this is a crucial, crucial point, that there's a disjunction always between subjectivity and symbolic identity. And masculinity means I'm going to put my faith on the side of symbolic identity rather than on the side of subjectivity. So I'm going to opt for what the phallus provides, secure symbolic identity, as opposed to lack and subjectivity. Femininity, in contrast, is the embrace of the absence of the phallus and the failure of symbolic status. So that's why feminism and psychoanalysis are inherently linked. Any doctrine that understands phallus as the signifier of castration immediately privileges femininity over masculinity because masculinity is inherently self-deception, unlike femininity. We might say that feminism does not involve women taking up the phallus for themselves, 
or replacing phallus with the vagina. So lean in feminism would be this attempt to take up the phallus for oneself or maybe to call vagina phallus, whatever you might say. But that's not really feminism because feminism is the recognition that nothing lies beneath in contrast to masculinity, which is the belief in the beneath. So it's interesting that there's an inherent link. Femininity can lead us to feminism, which is a counter to masculinity and patriarchy. You might say feminism is the embrace of the nothing beneath. This is clear from the first great feminists, Mary Wollstonecraft, all the way up through Simone de Beauvoir and contemporary feminists. Here's how Alenka Zupancic puts it. Women are subjects who question the symbolic. Women are the ones who, by their very positioning, do not fully acknowledge its order, who keep signaling its negative, not fully their dimension. Why is this? It's because the position of femininity is the position attached to recognition of lack beneath what's not beneath, whereas masculinity is built upon the deception that there is some secure substance beneath. So masculinity is a belief in the substance of one's identity, whereas femininity is a belief in one's subjectivity. You might say femininity is the choice of absence rather than presence, whereas masculinity is an investment in the lie of presence. So femininity is the point of absence within the symbolic structure. There's a nice example of this, I think, in the Sofia Coppola film, Lost in Translation. This is how the film ends, and we can't hear what he's saying to her. We can't hear where the enjoyment lies, and it's precisely this absence that indicates the enjoyment and that indicates we're on a terrain here not covered by the phallus, not covered by the symbolic field. So it's important not to look at the scene and try to decipher what he's actually telling her, because this is the moment where he's saying goodbye, he's giving her this piece of advice or whatever he's saying, we can't hear it, but the point is to see that we can't hear. Because this seeing of the absence, this taking account of the absence, is precisely a way of resisting the notion of the phallus and its dominance. Let's look at another example of a kind of enjoyment that resists presence and that shows the point at which the phallus isn't covering what's happening, and it's in a film by David Lynch, Mulholland Drive, also a film focused on femininity. The scene comes at the end of the film when two characters come to a club, Club Silencio, which is a very important name, uh, and they see a performer perform, and she's performing, but she's lip-syncing the song, even though it looks as if she's singing it. And I think this is a really important, so it's the absence of what we should be able to hear, and we see this absence as we're watching. Que te quiero aún más, mucho más que ayer. Dime tú qué puedo hacer. No me quieres ya, y siempre. Tu amor se llevó. 
y quedó llorando, llorando, llorando. Both women are really moved in this scene, and what they're moved by is what's not there. So Rebecca Del Rio, the singer in this scene, is able to evoke absence, and then we recognize that what we're really enjoying is an absent voice, even though it seems like it's present. And I think that's the crucial thing here, that absence gets evoked in the guise of presence. You might say that patriarchy retreats from femininity as an absence, that it's a retreat from this absence that's beneath the signifier. It's a refusal to accept that what's beneath the signifier is not an actual present signified, but instead an absence. And that's what patriarchy is the refusal of. And it's a position that it identifies and it sees in the feminine. And this is a nice depiction of feminism as the embrace of absence, because we get Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, their first meeting, and they're almost shaking hands, but they're not quite shaking hands. But if this was a phallic monument, we'd see just one of them probably, but we'd also see them definitely connected. So the lack of connection here, the, the absence between is the connection. And that's feminism in contrast to phallicism. <laughs> 